Um, Hey everybody, welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Pro class. This is the fall and winter 2023-2024 class. Nice to see everybody here. Uh, this is our fourth class in the series in terms of our office hours. We've got a lot of great questions today, so we're going to jump in. There has been a request to talk a little bit more about uh, some design work that I've done on my site and property. So if we've got time, we'll come back and work on that. But um, if not, we'll uh, we'll come to it next week. All right, so we're going to share the screen as usual. Oh, that's the wrong screen to share. Let's share this one. There we go. All right. Move around a couple of tools. And we'll get to November 13th. Also, I've got a little bit of a cold flu thingy. So um, if I mute myself and you see me coughing, I mute myself and I'm coughing. <laughs> So from Minthia, you had mentioned about hookah culture stopping a fire in its track as it is like a sponge. Would creating a hookah culture moat around a zone one or two be realistic? Absolutely. Um, we did, and I think it's actually my my portfolio. You go to allpointsdesign.ca and, and projects, there's a big farm scale hookah. And it partially, it was created to create a bit of a fire break towards the, if I remember the site correctly, kind of the northwestern corner. Actually, I'll see if... Uh, I'll see if I can actually find it there. Uh, all points. I was just looking through uh, my archive of photos the other day and I saw the photos of it and I was thinking I should add it to this farm scale hoogle. There it is. I wonder if it actually shows the portfolio. Oh, no, it doesn't. Let's see if we can find Watercliff Farm on uh, Google Earth. Water left farm yeah let's see if we can find it on the internet water left farm on gabriel or galia gabriel island uh water cleft farm culture farm okay so we've got an address here these folks are brilliant it was such a fun workshop this is also another it's kind of a meta conversation here of, of us talking because there's such an opportunity. I was just talking with my apprentice um, for values-based decision-making. There's such an opportunity to bring, oh, wow, it looks so amazing. Um, there's such an opportunity to bring people to the work you do by providing small-scale educational workshops. And I look at workshops as people paying to interview me to for me to design with them because there's an opportunity for them to learn something. But ultimately, it's a great way for people to learn, you know, who's Jab and what does he do? How does he work? Is he a good fit for me? So, um, yeah, keep that in mind. And if we want to talk about that later on, I'd be happy to do so. Okay, so this is Watercliff. <clears throat> and when I was there, I remember this, this front area. There was a little bit of this done. And then this is the big hoogle. So this right here is this big, long hoogle. I don't remember how long it is. Well, actually, this is the great thing about this application is we can take a line and we can go, say, OK, and then bring it back up and then go measurements and then go feet. Yeah, 120, 140 feet. Yeah, or in meters for our metric folk about 36. So one of the reasons it was put in is that there was some worry about some fire risk here. And so this is a, a great way to bring it in. One thing that you'll notice here, and we kind of fought about this because they wanted it to be contiguous. And uh, I'm, I've am i done enough of these to know that you need pass through. And uh, they were so happy that they had the pass through because if it was one big long berm, it's kind of hard to get back there and work with it. So yeah, that was a, was a good example. All right, good question. Let's go back to our questions. Is it too much work for the amount of fire reduction? I don't think so, especially because it's a garden bed. So it's a garden bed that you can grow annuals on and you can grow perennials beside. Uh, remember, again, we do not want to um, we do not want to plant trees directly into agriculture because of the volume that it loses. If you put a tree in there, it'll fall over. <clears throat> so we don't want to do that. You usually want to put it on one side or the other. Um, is a fire likely to jump over it anyways? Well, and this is the thing. A hookah culture won't stop a crown fire. Nothing will. It has an ember front. It pushes those those embers forward. 
So just keep that in mind is that this is really to stop a ground fire from coming closer to the house or from, from uh, scaling up. Uh, I was thinking like at the edge of the zone to build the moat and then have berries or something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have lots of wood piles around the property from fallen wood and most of them have wild raspberries growing on them. So they clearly do well together. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, brambles is a different story. So if we, if we're into vines and brambles, brambles will absolutely have no problem in, in, um, in fallen over material. And this, this is not a <clears throat> official opinion this is not a science-backed opinion but it's an observation that the more i've seen vines as a functional plant within an ecosystem and when i see them the more i'm seeing them the more i'm seeing when they come up a tree they create all of this sail all this surface area so that way they can give a bit of push uh the more i'm thinking more and more is that vines are this incredible element within an ecosystem that's actually there to when a system has become too crowded or a system has become too long from disturbance cycles because disturbance is necessary so usually fire cycles those vines really act as a reclaimer they come and they bring down large trees by creating more surface area so that way they have more push against winds and storms and the other thing they do is once you have a pile on the ground, they knit that pile together. Um, I think we usually think of this as a bad thing or a terrible thing, but there is an element within that ecology that is there to cover and knit and create. And they're incredible doing that. Think about it. It's a vine with all, usually most vines, um, because they're so tender and have all these thorns. And so all those thorns are like, back off, don't come near me. We're decomposing. We're pulling things back down. And in some of those brambles and those briar patches, you get the most beautiful soil. So it's just an observation. I'm not saying it's a bona fide opinion by uh, by peer reviewed journals, but um, definitely been been an example and something I've seen before. And then from Minthia, would love to see your design work. Yeah, I've been um, going back through and pulling together a few things, and uh, I've got some things to show you if we have time today. So would be happy to do that. There's a great hula culture example. Thanks for that, Minthia. Any follow-up questions from you from that, Minthia? Um, any, like, what examples of what vine? I'm in zone 3A. Yep. So what kind of vines? All I can think of is stuff like clematis and sweet pea and, and uh, honeysuckle, mm -hmm. um, which are not really food. Well, sweet pea, I guess, would be food producing. But do you have any examples of other or like you mentioned brambles, do you mean like blackberries, which don't grow here? Yeah. Do you have so any other plant being, suggestions? Being in 3A, um, and again, I wouldn't use vines specifically for that effect unless I wanted that. Because in your okay. situation, you want a fire break and you want to grow food. Um, so if you did want to like create some sort of trellis and then but you know, have it beside the hookah culture. I've done that before. And then, you know, chosen my vine of choice. Um, some of the hardier crosses between the raspberries and the blackberries that works pretty well, but I wouldn't necessarily go to vines immediately unless there's a fruit there that you like. Otherwise the natural capital plant database, which you can find on assignment 17 um, is my go-to for all plant research. Uh, there's plants for a future. There's lots of different, um, resources out there, but Natural Capital Plant Database was created by Daniel Hals Housley and Paula Westmoreland. And it's a great resource. It's it's free to a point. I don't remember the functionality of it, um, but it's 25 bucks a year and it's just the best resource. So you type in 3A, um, 3A vines and you're going to get generally what's available out there. So I would go that way. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they've... They've created a great resource there. So yeah, you're most welcome. Hello to our latecomers. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see everybody's face. Hello. Nice waves. Okay, uh, Sydney. We got Sydney's question coming up. Let's go back to a little screen share. Here. Not specific to this course, but what are your thoughts on leaving the leaves on our yards? I was offered leaving the leaves on a yard, but a landscape designer I follow on Instagram who actually introduced me to this course stated that you live in regions that that do not have as a bioactive soil she is in utah then it's actually not a good idea to leave them since they won't break down and i'm thinking edmonton falls into this category 
Uh, I know you have experience living in Edmonton and Alberta. What are your thoughts? Okay, so this is a great question. And I'm going to kind of stop, share, and move some things over to where my, my, uh, where my camera is, because I hate it when people don't talk to a camera. It drives me nuts. So I'm not going to do it to you. So there's a couple of things here that are really important to take note of. And one of them is that there's this idea of brittleness. And it was an idea that Alan Savory kind of coalesced. He didn't make it, but he definitely coalesced it. And the idea is, is that on one side, you have a humid uh, environment and on the other side, you have an arid environment. And generally, the break between brittle and humid or brittle and um, arid and humid or brittle and not brittle is does decomposition happen organically? So is there enough water to facilitate organic decomposition or does it then go to oxidization and, and mechanical breakup as in a lot of the places that he works in Africa? The problem with very brittle environments is you have to apply different techniques and processes because if you don't have animals there, if you don't have animals like breaking up material, generally you have oxidization and then you have nutrients that are kind of locked up from that nutrient cycle that's so important as well as the mineral cycle so having lived in edmonton having worked in edmonton uh i can tell you that leaves are great in edmonton um and that again from a first principles perspective trees drop leaves to create more trees right when we take a look at that succession graph where you have like climax forest here and you have disturbance, grasses are usually on this side. Trees are on this side. This is bacterially dominated soil. This is fungally dominated soil. So when we move into those climax forests, when we go from disturbance to our first pioneers species, which are poisonous, prickly, and persistent, when we get into herbaceous cover, when we get into our small shrubs and our shrubland, and then we get into our, 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 our smaller trees and thickets, and then we move into our emerging forests and then our middle forests and our climax forests, that moves in that direction to the point to where when there are deciduous trees that drop their leaves or even coniferous trees that drop their needles like larch and tamarack, it's basically to create more fertile soil for more trees and less fertile soil for grass. So if we have leaves that are in an urban environment and they're dropping on grass, we have this interesting sort of successional uh, friction because they're, they don't naturally want to be together. Their soils aren't naturally working. And this is why we say that grasses are generally allopathic. They are detrimental to trees. So in this situation, when you are when you have leaves and you have an environment that actually does have enough moisture to decompose the leaves, see it all the time around Edmonton, we're actually not in a super arid environment. It may go arid at certain times of year, like during the winter um, or dur certain uh, during certain times during the summer and the fall. But generally... You know, Edmonton gets a fair amount of summer storms and they get a lot of moisture. So it does decompose. We've been talking a little bit about creating leaf mold with Linda, who we'll, we'll get to uh, down at the bottom. She has some aesthetic questions. But leaf mold is brilliant, beautiful, amazing. Make as much of it as you can. Basically, what you do is you take uh, stucco wire. And I like using stucco wire. And this helps to answer Linda's question. I like using stucco, stucco wire because it's kind of innocuous. Innocuous. Um, and you don't really, it doesn't really stand out in, in the landscape. It's just like a little bit of silver. And then you just see this big pile of leaves and it decomposes. So I like making that. So basically we take uh, a stucco wire, like two, three inch, and then we create a big circle. We create a, 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 a cylinder uh, and then we load it with leaves in the fall. And what that, ha what happens is it decomposes and it creates this beautiful potting mix. It, it's a great amendment to soil. It's a great intermediary between soil and mulch. Or you can just pile your leaves pretty high on your beds. Remember, you never want to pile your mulch close to any stems of plants because it creates a vector for disease. It can bring more moisture around the stem of a tree and uh, can help it to decompose. So I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be focusing on, you know, creating so much mulch that you can barely see the tree, but definitely, you know, four to six inches works really, really well. Uh, yeah, those are generally my thoughts. I'm just going to check and see if you're even on the call. I don't know if you are. You are not. All right. So that's my answer to you, Sydney. And then there are a couple of further explorations. One is an Alan Savory uh, video talking about understanding the brittleness scale. So he talks about that. He's been particularly vague 
on like the moment it goes from brittleness to non-brittle or arid to human. And I think it's more just an understanding that there are human environments where evapotranspiration doesn't overtake precipitation. So there's always ample moisture in the soil and in the area. And in arid environments, evapotranspiration is greater than precipitation. So generally there isn't a lot of water availability. It just means in those arid environments, we're really going to focus on organic matter in the soil, usually using animals, usually having more cycling of nutrients, but a really good question. From Christian, uh, I'm not sure, maybe you mentioned this already, but my design site is basically empty and no one is engaging with the site as of yet. Does that mean my current zone is all zone five? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and for those of you that have uh, sites that don't have a lot of activity on them right now, it may just be a zone four, a zone five. There may be like a little point where you, when you go and visit, that's generally where you are and you're there two or three times a year, which would make it a zone four. Um, or maybe you just haven't been there at all. There's nobody there and it's a zone five completely because it's untouched and unmanaged. Remember, zone one daily, uh, zone two weekly, zone three monthly, zone four a few times a year, and zone five left unmanaged. Um, also, don't invent zones. I don't know what's going on, but uh, over the last couple of assignments, uh, offerings of the course and the assignments that are coming in, people think that they can just invent zones and people are bringing in like nine different zones. Just learn permaculture as it is. You can riff later. It's like any musical instrument or anything you learn, learn the rules and then you can you can play with it later. But yeah, good question. From Linda, I'm gonna try joining in the later 30 minutes. Okay, so what we might do is skip her because she has asked for this a little later. And I'm just gonna keep an eye at 1030. And if somebody can let me know when she jumps on um, in the chat, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, Minthia, I shouldn't. Oh, right. I can't remember what was mentioned, but using wood mulch and garden beds was not recommended in fire prone areas. Do you have other suggestions for weed control? Also, if I have to move a lot of the forest, if I have to remove a lot of the forest around my house, what is the tallest plant tree or what height should I prune them to? I should be looking at planting and how close they are to be to the house, trying to create a cozy forest feel. Yeah. Which is funny because uh, as I was going through how the this East shop Huga culture garden that I wanted to show you folks today. One of the major reasons it was created there is because there was too many trees around the shop and it was a fire risk and it was a fall risk. So generally my conversation is 10 to 15 meters of fire break around the house. This means no trees. This means no large shrubs that aren't with a lot of water around them. So, um, you know, anything that has a hookah culture beside it, I'm fine with. Anything that is is vital during the driest uh, months of summer, I'm fine with. But if it's if it's tinder, then it, it doesn't come around. Um, the tallest plant, it doesn't really, you know, it's not really a conversation because really it's about if there's a ground fire, you don't want ladder, ladder fuels to take it to a crown fire. So I don't want the ability for things to step up. So in that case, I'm generally going to be conscientious of pruning everything around me to uh, basically uh, prune polling tree height, which for me is about, about like three to four meters, like 10 to 15 feet. Like generally I'm going to reach up as high as I can just to trim them up. And if there are shrubs around them, I, I'm going to try and trim those shrubs down or be conscientious about how I plant them because I don't want them to, to come up that way. And then, yeah, uh, your question about um, uh, uh, is there a resource I can look um, to find companion plants? Yeah, that would be the natural capital uh, plant database. Is that answer your question, Mintia? Uh Yeah. What, what would you consider like water, very water holding shrubs as opposed to, I guess, woody, like what... I mean, a shrub is a shrub to me. What do you consider? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, what's a wetter shrub? Yeah, if if it looks green and supple in the dry summer, that for me is a wet shrub. So in three A, um, your aronias are going to be like that, and they're great medicinals. Um, any of if if you decide to start planting any of the romance series out of the University of Saskatchewan, they're generally going to be pretty pretty drought tolerant excuse me <laughs> they're going to be pretty drought tolerant um your your gooseberries your has caps 
the has caps can get very dry in the summer. Um, so unless they were supported by Hugo's, I'd be conscientious about how close I put them to the house. Um, but generally, I, I just like herbaceous plants around the house. And then maybe like an aromatic or two. I don't remember what zone um, Ribes Odoratum clove currant is, but I really like Ribes o o Odoratum for temperate climates because it has this beautiful cinnamon smell and the berries stay ripe on it for like up to three weeks. So it's not like one and done and they're delicious, right? They're current. Um, so I like those. I think off the top of my head, I, I would basically go in and take a look at drought tolerant plants for three a in the natural capital plant database and take a look at that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Good to know about the half gaps. Cause I was planning on planting a lot of those because they grow awesome here but maybe that will be the maybe it'll be a half cap hugo culture moat that'd be good <laughs> yeah it'd be great that's that's what i got on mine i got half caps and currants and you know and and then on the other side yeah. i just have a lot of um, um self-sowing uh, annuals like a lot of flower self-sowing annuals like calendula and uh, marigold and you know, these flowers that'll produce tons of seed drop and then they come back again. They just continue, they continue that process, right? Yeah, nice. Perfect. Yeah, no worries. All right. Um, okay, cool, cool. Oh, the other one was about the mulch. Instead oh, mulch. of using um, yeah. wood chip. Yeah, so... The weed control. I'm... <laughs> I'm of two minds of this. Um, I know what Joan Webster OEM has said, and I appreciate what she says. But at the same time, I feel like like a little bit of wood mulch is not a huge issue. Um, and especially if you're using... Especially if it's wet. Especially if it's wet, for sure. But by by default or by, um, by, uh, by use, the top of the mulch is dry. That's the point of it. The top yeah. of it dries out, the bottom of it's wet, and then you have wet soil. Like that's what mulch does. So like the top is going to be dry regardless. And so in like major fire prone areas like Australia, she's like, no woody mulch whatsoever, no dry mulch whatsoever around the house. And I get it. Um, her big thing is using compost. So basically what she does is she basically uses soil as mulch. She uses like high organic matter compost as mulch which for those of us that know how much time and effort it takes to make compost is like oof, that's uh that's a lot like <laughs> that's a lot to do to create mulch um but i get it it's organic matter but its structure is such that it would resist burning you know if you've ever tried to to burn rich organic matter it's very difficult to do because it holds a lot of water so you know i think if i remember correctly you're in alberta right yeah um close to Edmonton. So I would probably be, be fine with wood chips or hog fuel. Hog fuel is when it's like the bark and everything's ripped up and it's kind of shredded. I wouldn't have a huge problem using it myself, but if you are, and if you're worried about it, compost is her solution, but it's not a perfect solution. Like nothing is. Would it be like, if I just, what I, I don't know if this would control uh, weeds if I put put the mulch down and then just added compost layer to the top of it, then are weeds going to grow on top of it? For sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the other reason. It's like this whole idea of using compost as mulch. Like I remember her saying. I'm, this. I'm just feeding, <laughs> feeding the weeds at that point. And depending how the compost is made, it usually comes with weed seeds, right? There's usually undesirable seeds that are in that right. material, yeah. right? So yeah, it's kind of the brilliance of the back to Eden system with wood chips is that, you know, you're creating soil in place. This is, you know, this is the conversation is if you have wood together and leave it for a long time, you'll have soil. It happens. Right. It's, if you've ever cut into an old apple tree, you know, you find a big dead branch and usually the middle is pure black gold it's just beautiful soil because it decomposes and it becomes high carbon material soil so yeah there's not there's not a perfect solution but i wouldn't worry about like big fat chips like igniting um if there is a wildfire that's coming towards you 
generally it's going to be that ember spark. And I think that's her point. Like that ember spark, that ember front could like find its way into your mulch and ignite. And she's right. So not a perfect solution. Right. Have have a good irrigation system. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Have a good irrigation system. Have really vibrant, beautiful beds that are mostly covered in green instead of the mulch right. underneath them. <laughs> not uh, not dead, ideally. Not dead. I, yeah, have gardens that are living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you came here for the most important advice. Have gardens that are living. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, and and like that's the thing. Like when I'm doing and working with my own food garden and this is sacrilege this is total sacrilege in the permaculture world and this is why i'm a lowercase p permaculturalist and don't really care if i'm called it i there's a lot of 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 stigma and deification in in this sphere and i just i I want none of it so years ago a friend of mine called himself a lowercase p permaculturalist and i was like yeah i'm using that it's a tool in my tool belt it's not everything i do um i grow all of uh, when I was in Canada, I grew all of our own food um, and I did all of it. You know, every once in a while, my husband would help me with the harvest or a little bit of planting, but generally it was up to me to do it. And I have a major straw allergy. Like I can be in bed for 36 hours sleeping if I get too much of that fine straw dust in my nostrils. Um, and so I was following uh, and working with a good friend of mine who used uh geo-woven textile which is a plastic product but he'd been using it for 20 years and he was still using the same piece of plastic but it's you basically cut out holes through a stencil and you burn holes in it with a little tiger torch or like a a weeding torch and then you just have this little area where the plant can grow and then your weeding surface area is down to like a very little amount and that became what i did on that area and then my husband would help me do big straw mulching and as Kevin is saying, yeah, you've got to mulch every year, 100%. <laughs> there is no no mulch solution. Um, the geo-woven textile is pretty good. I used uh, DeWilt or DeWalt, DeWilt, I think it's DeWilt Sunbelt, um, rated for like 15 years. And it's, it's wide enough that you can do 30-inch beds with a little bit of pathway. But I really like putting wood chips or swales in my pathways, usually coming from a source of water. This works great in urban environments where you take your your downspout on one of your downspouts and you run it through a pathway system. And then you fill that pathway system that are swales with soil or pardon me, with um, wood chips. And what will happen is those wood chips within two or three years will become soil. And you're basically mining your pathways for soil. It's a really cool way of building soil. But that's been my approach because I've got this major straw allergy and uh, I would love to mulch my beds with straw or something that's a little bit easier to handle and work with. But this had allowed me to do it quick and easy. And so as I've been having colleagues and friends come over over the years, they're like, you use plastic? I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm one person. I can't, uh, I can't do this by myself. Um, and also weed all of this and keep the food growing and all the rest of it. So, yeah, but on my, on my fruit trees and on like my berry bushes and everything else, I like wood using wood chips as long as I can get access to them or large scale hog fuel and, uh, applying them every year and working with them. Generally, you're only weeding with a rake or like a small pronged or like a stirrup hoe. So that way you can just move the wood chips back and forth and it'll break up the root of the plant that's in there and that works really well. Ah, okay. Um, one of the things I love doing on my beds, on my annual beds, and I do this to prep any bed I'm working on is I do what's called the stale, stale seed bed technique. It's been around for years. Basically you take a tarp and after the last melt in winter, so the tarps are off in the winter. So that way the ground gets recharged. So that way there's deep water action that's pulling in you then put a tarp i use three to six mil a um silage poly so basically it's black on one side white on the other and basically you stretch it out across your entire garden bed and you leave it there for a month month and a half and it does two things that are really important one is it warms the soil because you put the black side up so that way it absorbs more heat basically in temperate climate 
the major thing we're missing is heat units. And we're missing it for two major reasons. One, wind. We get so much wind and wind can take like 30 to 40% of uh, animal's weight off of it. If it's in a wind quarter, it can take 30 to 40% of the heat from a building. So it's really important to focus on shelter belts and wind breaks, especially in the prairies where you are. And then the second thing <clears throat> is when those seeds that have been left there from the year before pop up and they hit black plastic and they don't hit sun and they don't have what they need, they die out. And then the next crop comes up and the next crop and the next crop. So you get what's called a stale seed bed. I wouldn't say it's, you know, pasteurized or sterilized or anything like that, but it's definitely stale. Uh, and it just means that the weed pressure in that year of gardening is very little because it's had this process. And if you do this year after year, after year, after year, especially if you're in your annual garden beds, um, you'll find over time that, uh, that weed pressure drops. That doesn't work for your perennial areas. Um, but that also kind of brings into the conversation of, are you grazing those animals if you're that like level or scale, or if you're still in an urban scale, um, you can usually manage it with one person. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, great questions. Love your questions. Okay, from Maeve. <clears throat> I'm just gonna check and see if Maeve's here. I think I saw her, yeah, awesome. All right, uh, for finding the azimuth on the sector compass slide, uh, should we set the time to noon? Yeah, so the azimuth is just the degree angle. And uh, let me just, I brought it up here. So I'm just gonna share my slide again. Can you share, share this one? This one, cool. So azimuth, the direction of a celestial object from the observer expressed as the angular distance from the north or south pole to a point in which a vertical circle passes through the object intersects in the horizon. So what does that all mean? So this is a great example here. So basically, if we're the observer and we're facing north, the azimuth is basically the degree at which that sun would rise or set. You know, where, where does something happen on that compass that is, if we're wherever we're standing, usually zero is in front of us, but for convention within cartography, zero is set at north. So if the sun comes up 30 degrees uh, east of north, on uh, the summer solstice, because <clears throat> usually it comes up higher on the compass. That's that azimuth, that's when it pops up. So um, yeah, should we set the time to noon? Yeah, you should almost always set the time to noon when you're doing your sun earth tools or you're using any of the sun earth calculators. Um, the only reason for that is it'll give you a sense of where the apex of the sun is in the, the arc of the day. Second question, I'm struggling with finding a balance between allowing sun to come into the gardening areas while still maintaining taller trees that provide the majority of the background habitat. Unfortunately, the south side of my yard is bordered by pine trees, so that area would benefit from sun is, from sun are pretty shade. Do you recommend keeping the trees and relocating the garden? Or, okay, Maeve, can you give me your link to your assignment, your portfolio? And just as a reminder to everyone, always link to your assignment because um, that'll give us the ability to uh, quickly bring it up and, and chat about it. Just have to pull it up real quick. Yeah, no worries. Okay, it should be on there now. Okay, sweet. Okay, I'm gonna move you to the big screen only because it'll give me space. Oh, right. You did the hand drawing. I just was uh, looking at this today. Great. Okay, I'm just taking a second to load. Okay, let's go to your base map. Okay, so we're going to share the screen. All right, so talk to me about your question here. Where Where are the areas that you're you're working on and if you want to go into the assignment and just make a layer and a polygon or something or um i think you can take control or annotate as well i'm not sure my wi-fi is pretty bad right now so everything's taking a really long time to load but if i add the layer and then send you a message on canvas um can i just ask the question again and then have you respond there yeah, for sure. Like skip answering it here. Yeah. 
Sorry about that. Everything's uh, like my slides aren't really loading, so yeah, I can't add that layer right now. No worries, no worries. I will um I will talk a little bit about something while we're all here because it may be a useful uh, aspect to work with. This is called a sunshade audit, a sunshade audit. And uh, it's done by hand. And I like it for that reason, because it really gives you an observational capacity on small properties. On large properties, this is out the window. You use other tools. But on small properties, it works out um, really well. So one thing you do is you basically go out kind of during solstice or during equinox. And again, you only have to go through two solstices and one equinox. Equinoxes are the same. Sorry, I'm just going to mute whoever just jumped on. Um, and basically what you do is you go out, you go out with your base map and then you go out with transparencies with, um, transparency paper or vellum. And what you do is you basically go throughout the hour and you chart exactly where the sun and where the shade is. So you go out and red is usually sun. So let's say we're out at like 6am in the morning and say it's summer. So that means the sun's going to be high in the sky but it's just going to be coming up. So generally these are all going to cast shadow. So I'm just going to grab a blue. So, oh, that's also not the tool I wanted. They changed the whole system here and it's, all right, let's do a bigger one. All right. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Cool. So probably going to be some shade around here. If we're coming up in that area, probably some shade over here, over here, over here. I'm just, thinking about where the sun would be i'm not saying this is perfect by any stretch of imagination uh, probably something here in the house of course we'd cast a long shadow in this in that morning time <coughs> excuse me this long shadow here and here so you'd be going out walking around and, and roughly placing this into the landscape Great. So that would be the shadows for, let's call it 6 a.m. or something like that. And then you would come in and you would put where the sun is. So you just come in and you draw. And this is kind of done with pencil crayons or like light markers or highlighters. Highlighters work really well. Which, funny enough, is exactly what this tool is called in Zoom. So you do that at, let's say, you know, as soon as the sun rises and then a couple hours later, you can go every hour or three hours. I like going three hours because it's less work. Um, so three hours later, you would do this all again on a new piece of vellum. Now, I can't necessarily keep this as a layer in Zoom, but I'm going to take a photo and maybe it'll be useful to us. So a couple hours later, <clears throat> you'd come back in. And so now we're like nine or something. If it was six, let's say that the sun came up um, earlier in the summer months, but and just for the sake of argument. So now it's like, it's it's, it's kind of coming from this direction. Um, so now it's going to be a little higher. So those shadows are going to, shadows are going to be a little uh, stouter, a little shorter. Um, you do it the same way. And if you're thinking ahead, you may start to get a sense that when you put red and purple together, you get shade or red and blue together, you get shades of purple. And this becomes a really interesting do-it-yourself way of understanding the shade on your site. Because if you put all the transparencies together, you can literally see, well, what's sunny all day? Uh, what's sunny some, some of the times? What's sunny towards the end of the day? And how do all these things look when you put them together? So this can be a great way of, of an, analyzing where the sun is in the site. What does it look like? Where are we seeing it? There we go. <clears throat> so if we put this over top with our second one as a transparency, uh, what we would get is we'd start to get these gradations of, you know, full sun, half sun, <laughs> excuse me. And so over the day, you get the sense of the sunshade audit. So if you're looking this up, wanting to do this yourself, and you want more explicit instructions, that's, that's what you would look up. Any questions about that? I don't think so. Um, so you would recommend like surveying where the sun hits like three times a day? 
every three hours for whatever that section of time you're looking at you know if you're doing it winter solstice um and if you're like where i'm at like the sun's not rising until like 6 6 37 and it's setting i think on december 21st it's like 3 30 3 40 so you're only going to get like one two three maybe four times during the summer solstice you may get like maybe six or seven uh, probably six so okay, just thank and, you. yeah it's a good good exercise to go through if, if you want to become more observational about the the solar real estate or the solar asset you have on your site All right, looks like Linda's here. So we're gonna pop back to her question. I'm just gonna share my screen again. All right, I'm gonna try and join later. Yep, uh, thank you for your feedback, especially last week. I learned there's a difference between presentation and process. And because I am both the designer and the customer, my brain cannot separate the two. I was wondering when making a presentation for a potential customer, how much do you take into account the person's learning style, ability and preferences? Great question. Uh, that's a brilliant question. So. I generally show clients before we work together what the outputs will look like. And I ask them if that works for them. So I've moved to doing mostly Google Earth Pro as an output for a concept design. And then for detailed design, I am either working with a third party renderer or I'm working with Morfolio Trace because it's easy and I like drawing. Um, so I usually ask them how it works for them and how they see it and how they can work with it. Uh, and I show them examples. Um, I used to do these, or I used to contract these incredible 3D renders of uh, sites. Hold on, let me show you, um, what was that called? I'll show you one to just give you a sense of what that might look like. And uh, those types of sort of three-dimensional designs and really getting into things like Blender, or Rhino, or those types of processes, um, they can help a lot of folks who are, they have problems like envisioning a site, uh, seeing that, or if you have a group of people, so let's say you get hired and you're working for um, a company or a, a, a conversation that has a board and they have to vet the process or take a look at something, um, that can be important. So this was um, a uh, this was a rehab center um, for folks who were coming off of drug and alcohol, and. Uh, the the three-dimensional aspect of this really helped them to see what it would look like in the future um and then all of these little areas were this concept design so what was going where why was it there and and this uh accompanied like a i think 160 page feasibility report of the whole conversation but it turned out really well so you can go all the way to this level or you can go to you know simple pen and paper drawings what I was told years ago by a landscaping professional who's been in the business for 40 years is uh, a pencil drawing is a great idea and a digital drawing is reality. And it's funny because I'm going through all my stuff and, and getting rid of a bunch of stuff. And I found all my original designs and drawings all on transparency paper, all using markers. And it's stunning because you look at that, which we just saw, and then you can take a look at like, some of these these drawings I did and you just see the difference like it's true it's like a pencil drawing is just an idea and once you digitize it or you print it into something that's more conventional like a drawing plan or something like that people really get a sense like oh this is real this is reality to the point to where I used to print I did this design for the city of Victoria it was a dog park and we were trying to make we were kind of presented with the problem of how do we deal with the dog feces um, and do it in such a way so that way there's less plastic, less waste, all the rest of it. Well, dog compost is notoriously hard to, to compost in an aerated fashion in the way that we normally do it. So I created the dog, the Harewood, Harewood Dog Park Guild. I just, I just found this it's a big design. And basically what it is, I bet you I have a, uh, oh, there we go. Of course we do. Um, basically it was it was the core of it was there was this um anaerobic digester you've seen these before these are these cones and it was this anaerobic di digester and around it were all of these oh here it is it's found it all around it were all of these broadleaf perennials so that way you could use the broadleaf perennial to to grab a leaf 
pick up the dog poop and put it into the anaerobic digester. So here it is. Um, the dog operational guild or dog. I thought it was very witty. It was so witty. Uh, and so this was all rendered in just an Inkscape program. And so basically it was a sign that shows what to do and how to do it. And then there was all these broadly perennials like uh, Borge, Coltfoot, uh, Comfrey, Ignatia, El Campaign, Elephant's Ear, Hollyhock, Hosta, Globe Artichoke, Leopard Plant, Mullen, Rhubarb, and Tree Collard. So all of this was the ability to kind of bring this in. And, and this was a co-design I did with uh, Hatchet and Seed Contracting um, to redesign this uh, this park to be, uh, to be a food forest. We did these guilds around each of the trees because there was a bunch of tree existing or pre-existing trees. And so we put in the designs in this way and then uh, developed this uh, portfolio or, or, or brochure uh, to the Vic West Food Security Collective. Um, yeah. So in terms of how do you separate it and what do you show to your clients, basically you ask them uh, you know, what works for you by saying, this is what I do, does this work? And if they want more, you price it accordingly. So that this took me a long time to learn that generally clients will be happy not to pay for a lot of rendering. Um, the the minimum amount to get it in the ground is usually the best amount of money because you get more projects in the ground. Any follow up to that, Linda? Before I go on to your next question. No follow up. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. And then your next question is, I'm using GeoBin to make leaf mulch in the areas that have wet shade microclimate. Unfortunately, it's taking away the manicure view from the front. Since it's a year or more for it to be done, how can I improve the property view and still use it? What can I do to hide it? Great. So I, is this the little bin here from the front? Yes. Yes, it is. From afar off, like as I'm driving away. Okay. Gotcha. 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 Okay. Yeah. So first I'm going <laughs> to first I'm going to make a caveat here of I worked in construction for many years I was a contractor's aide to my dad and my dad took a very strong view on aesthetics which was I install it you decide what's beautiful and I'll start there by saying the aesthetics for each person are going to be different um personally for me if I know that things are decomposing and becoming more fertile soil I'm actually for them and I don't have any problem with them what you may want to do is move to um, something that isn't black, uh, something that's more towards what we were talking about at the beginning, where we've got stucco wire and you use stucco okay. wire, and then it just looks like layered leaves. And then it kind of becomes a, a, a feature of inquiry where people are like, well, what's that? What's that about? Or okay. what you may want to do is just move everything to the back. And just if you this is the material you have and this is what you can use, move it to the back and then gravel the leaves and put it in there. It's a little bit more um work but that's aesthetics for you you know if you want something specifically the way you want it you may have to move it the other thing you could play around with and you know this is this is kind of out there but if you wanted to change it or work with it you may want to grab like some plastic lattice from uh the local home hardware store or, or whatnot okay. or some kind of surfacing to do like um a hex hexagon so it looks like a feature and then okay you know, have something grow up it but for me i just i'm so far into this way of thinking and living it's like if that's creating beautiful soil it's beautiful by extension so <laughs> i don't know if it's the answer you're looking for <laughs> no i appreciate it uh american pokeweed also known as phytolaca americana is poisonous and is located on a sunny area of the property the south facing soap when is the best time to remove it and can i compost it in a woody area forested area to the north so wildlife can enjoy them if i remove it now how much of the area with leaves would just grow back okay great question um i'm not totally familiar with american pokeweed okay. But I can speak generally and I can do a bit of research um, and come back with a more complete answer for next week. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just put this down in November 28, 7. And I'm going to put a note from Javin to Javin. Javin, research this. Um, so this is great because this is a question that we can all 
benefit from because we're going to talk about generality. So generally, when we're talking about getting rid of species that we don't appreciate, uh, we're talking about hitting it at its most vulnerable, usually. And normally for plants, this is when plants are engaged in the very energy intensive process of procreation. So usually at flowering stage, before even nascent seed is set, at flowering stage, this is usually when you can hit a plant and it'll do the most amount of damage to its local vigor or life force or what have you. So I don't know when pokeweed flowers, but generally I would think that would be the time to hit it. Um, and I also don't know if it's if it's a seed-based propagation or rhizome-based propagation, but they're, they're generally the same how we approach it. So generally what I do if I'm trying to get rid of plants that are, are, are rhizome-based is kind of two things. One, in a perfect world, what you would do is you would plow and rake and plow and rake and plow and rake. And what happens is when you plow and rake, that material actually comes to the top. There's this, there's this uh, law in physics that large things, when aggregated, will come to the top. It's the reason when if you're you ever got a bowl of nuts and you shake it, the large nuts come to the top or in avalanche safety and security, why they now have these big balloon suits that will completely engulf the person because that'll come to the top when you're being riding. So if I had that opportunity, I would do that. And the reason for this is I've worked with, um, tried to work with morning glory and bindweed and they're super pernicious. Their roots can stay active and their seed, pardon me, their seeds can stay active, I think over 450 years. And it can, their roots can come back from like a quarter inch cut. So a quarter inch cut can make a brand new plant. So generally this idea of plow and rake brings it to the top. And then you can take that material and you can throw it into a tarp uh, and then you can solarize it. So basically you take a, a, a tarp with black on one side, put the material on top, wrap it up, let it bake for a year, make sure it's totally dead. Uh, this is one way to take care of that root material. If that isn't an option to, to go to that extreme where you don't want to do that because after that, you really have to rehabilitate the soil because generally disturbance in the soil destroys the mycelial network and destroys the uh, soil food web associations and interactions. Uh, what we found is that if you scalp it during that time, so you take a weed whacker or a brush cutter and scalp it right down to the bottom. And this is true for a lot of the pernicious weeds. Um, and then you take agricultural vinegar, which is usually 12%. You can, uh, you can get it at agricultural supply stores. And then you get a backpack sprayer. Um, backpack sprayers should never be bought secondhand from agricultural outfits. They're almost always laden with um, broad scale insecticides or pesticides. If you want to buy them used, buy them from forestry, uh, specifically firefighting. Uh, almost almost never is fire retardant put into the backpacks. They're, norm they're normally always water, but you want to check. Also, <clears throat> they're easy to clean out and not clog. Um, so they're very serviceable as opposed to the, uh, the insecticide or pesticide sprayers that you get from agricultural supply stores or... Um, or automotive supply stores, they're usually very finicky and they'll plug up. And, and so if you're using something like vinegar, you may want something that's easier to use. And basically we spray agricultural vinegar, 12% diluted, maybe one to two, one to three, depending on how strong you want it and how much you want it to last and how much reapplication you want to put. You spray it into the cut Mary stem. So we've got the xylem and the phloem. And basically what we're doing is we're introducing uh, a, a, a a non detrimentative to the surrounding environment, i.e. it's not a persistent neurotoxin um, like glyphosate or DDT or, or something like that, uh, but it will eventually decompose, but it will kill pretty much anything because vinegar is, is a biocide. So you basically sp spray it into the Mary stem, the cut stem of the plant and over multiple applications that will come into the roots and then it will kill it. I've used this to kill trees. I've used this to kill um like uh, rhizome spreading trees like elm. I've used this to kill uh, uh, bindweed, um, not totally successfully because bindweed's a stone special animal, uh, but it's it's been very useful. And then you put on a tarp, same thing like we were talking about before. So you put on thick plastic, three to six millimeter agricultural plastic or silo plastic. I usually put the hot side up so that way it encourages growth and it encourages the plant to find sun, can't find it. And it just... Uh, wastes 
more energy because basically you're trying to exhaust the energy in the plant uh, as well as um, break the cycle of seed. Now, if you're working with something that has a, a seed lifetime of hundreds of years, it's going to be very difficult to do that. <laughs> so just know the battle you're coming up with when you get it there. The other way to look at it, and this is Dow Ryan's approach in her book, um, The War on Invasives, which is a great book. She's an instructor and administrator of this course and just brilliant to read, is really think about why that plant is there. What function is that plant providing? What is it doing? Really be, really get to know this plant as a functional element within your ecology. What is it doing? What role is it playing? And then start to make your decision of, should it be here? Is this actually a plant that's serving an ecological function? And can I work with it? Can I guild with it instead of having um, some kind of hate on for this plant and having a job for life? There has been, and I continually say this during all class, and I'm totally willing to be wrong, but I still haven't had somebody correct me. We, we have one no plant invasive war like that we've never had a plant that was introduced to an area either by humans or animals by the way we're both the same we're still animals and seeds have been moving around the planet since the invention of seeds since the evolution of seeds so we have never won that war so what if we tried to understand it work with it guild with it see if there's a functionality of that plant in our landscape see if it's a nitrogen fixer see if it's doing good work we had this situation out on the coast. There's a plant called Scotch broom and it is vilified by everyone. It is the bane of everyone's existence, but it's a nitrogen fixer and the bloom is narcotic. It's the only time in Seattle when the road rage dies down. There's a beautiful study done when the Scotch broom blooms, Seattle road rage goes down for a little bit because it's a narcotic. Everyone's just a little bit more chill. So here's a plant that produces nitrogen creates biomass if somebody was going to give me a gravel yard and say i want you to recover this i'm an in place and i'm in a place like the west coast of north america i would consider scotch broom as a tool because once you get an overstory this is one of the things to learn about what we would call weeds which is just plant racism right it's just saying i don't like you i'm going to call you a word but it's really it's just an advantageous plant that's working in the ecology that it's in once you get overstory, you don't get scotch broom. It's just, it won't thrive in deep shaded areas. Once you go like 30 feet into the forest, it's not there. The final chapter of this story is uh, there's a Gary Oak Ecosystem Preservation Society out there. And uh, they love getting excited about the Gary Oak Ecosystem. They forget that the Gary Oak Ecosystem was managed by people, specifically the First Nations out there, the Salish and the Coast Salish, and that they would burn these areas and that they would plant camas there and do these big pit roasts and very cool, very anthropological, biological aspect. Um, but they forget that. And so when I was invited to speak, probably the last time I was inspired, invited to speak at an invasive conversation, because I have, I, have, I have a non-conventional contrarian viewpoint towards it. Um, they said, well, what about Scotch broom? It's always in the Gary Oak ecosystem. I said, no, it's not because the Gary Oak ecosystem doesn't exist. The Gary Oak ecosystem is managed by First Nations and it has a fire aspect and has an interaction aspect. Where are you seeing Scotch broom? And they said, well, it's right beside the asphalt pathways that we've laid so people can see the Gary Oak ecosystem. So when you change that conversation, you're already introducing an element that was never there since the inception of that ecosystem that was an, an anthropologically managed ecosystem. So I would become very curious if I were you, Linda, about this plant. I would be very curious about its functionality. I would look it up on, on some of the resources on assignment 17, like the Natural Capital Plant Database, Plants for a Future. Um, I would see if there's any um, uses, if there's any uses for it in other places in the world. So usually these plants are from some other place, and usually the indigenous people of that place have learned how to work with that plant in some way, shape, or form. And then I may start to see if it actually has a place on your site and if it can be used. And if not, you can go to that first process to, to slowly work on its material that's living and its genetic material and kind of, uh, quote unquote, weed it out over the years. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, great question. Yes. Thanks so much. 
Any other final questions or any follow-up questions to anything that we've gone over today that have kind of sparked an idea or like, huh, I wonder, or maybe that would be interesting here or any questions about that? Um, since we were talking about leaves and mulch I'm, and I've just done the fall cleanup in my garden, I come from a like uh, boutique gardening background. Uh, like flowers and whatever. And we used to just cut things to um, a few inches and then throw the rest in the compost or the garbage. What do you guys do? Do you do, you do that in permaculture? Do you just let it be on the soil? Do you cut it back and let it be? How do you deal with your fall cleanup? Yeah, so generally the permaculture approach is chop and drop. So as you have material coming up or biomass that's being created that you don't want for one reason or another, fall cleanup, getting things ready, whatever, usually it's a chop and drop. So you cut it and you let it down. Um, the other thing you do is you leave it. So right now I've got a bunch of mullen stems and old sunflower stems that are in the garden. And for anybody who looks at it, oh, that's ugly. Oh, that shouldn't be there. But it provides habitat over the winter. So I leave almost all my large stems, including things like hollyhock or like our, my, the big thick um, sunflower stems, because usually you'll have um, hibernating native bees that'll find their way in there and they'll they'll use that for for the, the winter. Um, and then usually after the first frost, it's about three to four weeks and then I'll I'll chop up everything and then throw it into the compost. Something I learned from a farmer years ago, and it's amazing to watch it happen, is if you have very um, carboniferous materials, very ligandous materials, if you spray it with a little bit of sugar, what will happen is it will increase the microbial attraction to that area, and that microbial action will actually create more decomposition. So he used to spray his cornfields after he had harvested, because you have all those stems and stalks, because he was a, a no-tiller. Um, but he wanted a way to decompose the stocks on mass and it kind of created issues for his, his planting materials, his drill seeds. He would spray his entire field with sugar at the end of the end of the season. And it was incredible. He had these videos um, after the season, after the winter season, he could go up to a stem and he could just grab it and it would disintegrate in his hand, as opposed to usually over the winter it would be very hard um, to move and create. So if we take that principle and apply it to anything, Sugar introduced to a system will increase the microbial activity. Dr. Elaine Ingham figured this out as well. It's one of the reasons why she used to, initially, she used to introduce, don't do this, this is me telling you what not to do, to create the conversation about what to do, but don't do this. She used to add sugar, specifically molasses, to her aerated compost extracts and teas. And what she found is it would spike the microbes that were the bacteria but it would retard the growth of fungals. And what she found out over time is that there was other things she could feed, things like fish emulsate and other types of fine rock dust powders that would do the same job without creating this big issue. So in that sort of fall cleanup conversation and boutique gardening, and I worked with a company that was all about that modern look, um, it was an interesting balance to play with clients because clients will have a sense of what looks good and i'm I've, I've said this before but i'm an advocate for the land first the client's money second and their wants third so i will always make the case to a client about what is ecologically better first and then the money it saves them before acquiescing to any any demand or any desire because my job that i've chosen for myself is to become a regenerative ecological designer land designer so it's my job to provide that as an approach. So for you, if you want to introduce that into your work or not, that's your choice. And then from there, generally chop and drop. So we chop it down and we create, we use it as mulch. Um, and we talk about plants that are mulch makers, things like comfrey, because they produce such a prolific amount of leaf. If you're going to use comfrey in your garden, buy the seed sterile version or source it. This is the Bocking, B-O-K-I-N-G 14, Bocking 14 variety. It's seed sterile. Comfrey, once it gets into your garden, is there for good. If you ever rototill your comfrey, you will have thousands of plants because like um, bindweed, it can grow from a quarter inch of a root cutting. Uh, so just be conscientious. There's this idea that uh, in permaculture, the burden is on the designer. So what we introduce 
it's it's on us to understand completely and be very conscientious about what we do. This is one of the reasons why when we started and we talked about expectations, I hopefully tempered most people's expectations by saying you're not going to take a PDC and become a designer out of the gate. It's going to take a couple of years for you to build confidence and experience, but also just to have, at least in the way that it came to me, was this fear of doing the wrong thing and creating an ecological chain reaction that had negative consequences as opposed to positive to really be certain that I'm okay to put this plant here. I'm okay to allow this here. And when you take a look at what's on the invasive list or what's on the weed list, again, just plant racism, just we, we determine as people where we want that plant or not. Um, it creates a lot of motivation to become smarter and just to become more well-read and more researched about these things. So yeah, chop and drop is the short answer. All the rest of it is the long answer. So how do you, if you're chopping and dropping, how do you avoid like a sticky, slimy mess in the spring? That's part of it. <laughs> so <laughs> you, yeah. you just work it into the you just work it into the soil come springtime? Usually, usually, or it becomes compost, okay. one or the other. So if it's something that really does create like a gross thing to work in, I'll usually put yeah. it into the compost. But if it's dry enough that it's just gonna create fiber uh, like straw, then I'll leave it. It's kind of a plant by plant basis, you know, like oh, okay. I used to I have think uh, like oh, Oh, well, just on my property, we're so like uh, soil poor, I guess. We're, it's the worst garden I've ever had in my life mm. um, because it's all rocks. <laughs> it's it's like a little bit of organic matter and there's just not enough to, I was thinking of chopping and dropping and I'm just like, oh, it's just going to be an absolute, there's nothing to work it into except mm. for rocks and sand and a little bit of dirt. So I think- that's kind of like we're gonna have to start by bringing in dirt and then working it in that way yeah or, or i might use it as materials or ingredients for a lasagna garden where the fall cleanup is the stockpile of materials i'm going to use for my carbon when i start doing lasagna gardening to build soil right to layer that and right. build you know basically lasagna i guess you could all, also throw it in your throw it in your hugo hugo culture 100 percent. 100 percent. the one thing to keep in mind is you don't want to leave hugos open there's this idea that you can like keep one end open forever and just, you know, continually uh, create it. Worst idea ever. It introduced uh, the area or the hugo culture to, to rodents. And once rodents are in there, they love whatever you're growing in that garden as much as you do. So Ooh. generally with hugo cultures, you want to dig it, put the wood in, put any small materials you want in there. I've got a full video on YouTube of a hugo I did years ago. And we, it was kind of a step. It was one of the first videos I ever did. Um, and it's for full step-by-step -step, uh, process. There's, there's Safari here. I'll, I'll grab it and put it up here to show folks. Um, but just the materials we put on was like any uh, vegetative material. At the time we were running a microgreens business and we had all these spent pea sprout trays. So you would cut the pea trays and we just layered everything around the hugo cult because we had it. If I can find this Hugo, it's a, it's a good one. Um, people always ask, do you have to dance on top of it? And I'll leave that as a cliffhanger. Uh, you don't. <laughs> hey, John, can I, can I hear something? I don't know if yeah, is in, are you in the United States. No, I'm in Canada and Ecuador. Is the two places. Oh, is, uh, is, is Mintia in the United States? Uh, she's in, uh, I think she's in Alberta. Oh, Alberta. I, I had, um, I had a, a patch in the yard that was like the soil was terrible because um, I had pine trees there and it was just like um, it was covered in poison ivy and I had a lot of sand and rock. And what I did was I got there's a website in the U.S. called Chip Drop and it's just like you sign up and the arborists come and like dump tons of chips for you. And that's what I did for a year. I got like a huge load of wood chips. I covered all the bad soil wood chips and then I slowly started integrating like compost into the wood chips. So it took about two years. But now those wood chips are broken down and now I, it's kind of like taller now, the soil, that patch. Um, but I have stuff I can grow on now. So I didn't, I didn't bother trying to work anything into the soil. I just covered it um, and waited. Yeah. And it's, it's, worked, it's, worked really, it's, it's worked really well for me um, in that sense. No, it's the, a, the one it's thing with the wood chips though is 
wood chips is it's really back breaking. They're heavy. Um, I, 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 what I'm doing now is I collect my neighbor's leaves and I put all the leaves and I mix it with the wood chips because the leaves are just a lot lighter. <laughs> yeah. Time to, they, yeah. Less taxing on the body. Way of doing it. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Thick, thick wood chip mulch is amazing and produces mm -hmm. soil at such a big event or uh, pardon me, uh, quick scale. That's what I mean. I put the video of the hookah culture just below your question there um uh, at the end there um and then there's there's lots of great hoogles there but yeah this is all the same process we're basically replicating the floor the forest floor right so if we're taking a whole bunch of wood chips we're letting them decompose same thing as the back to eden uh gentleman down in the states um has a christian bent on his uh on his gardening process but uh it's just wood chips 24 7 it's always wood chips and it's really about how much material can we get on site and chip drop is great. Um, I remember a time before chip drop when you had to bribe uh, landscape companies with a six pack of beer for them to drop off and just create that, that input zone. And um, it's funny. I really like moving wood chips. <laughs> it's just a fun thing to do, but yeah. Uh, leaf leaf mold is a good example. And I think with that, we'll, we'll round out the conversation of, it's always about working from a first principles perspective when permaculture and using the materials that make sense for your site. So Ruth Stout, S-T-O-U-T, S-T-U-O-T, Ruth Stout got into her, I think, 70s or 80s, could no longer dig out her potatoes. And she decided the best way for her to make her potato beds was with straw because that's what she could do. So she basically, she would put her potatoes down on the ground, wouldn't dig them at all take a little bit of soil or compost, put them around the potato, just enough to cover them and then bury them in straw. And every time they had vegetative growth, she would bury the vegetative growth in straw. And over time, she created this amazing uh, Ruth Stout potato method, which I've used for years. That is the easiest thing to do because it's very easy to mound or heal your potatoes with straw than it is with soil. And uh, harvesting is a breeze. And over time, what happens is that interaction of those roots with the rest of that material, same thing that's happening with Kevin's conversation um, with uh, with layering it, there's seeds underneath there that are growing and interacting and that beautiful dance but that is the soil food web interacts with that material. Uh, fungal, fungus will mine that material and, and, and transform that material into soil over time. And so you create soil through these processes, which is the name of the game and everything we're doing. How can we create soil in the shortest amount of time? So yeah, I think wood chips is a great idea. If if I had both together, I might lay all that material down on the ground first, Minthea, and then I put the wood chips on top. So that way you don't deal with that that situation. But if you have access to lots of wood chips, it's brilliant. All right, folks, uh, didn't get to the hookah culture conversation today, which is great. Gives me another week or two weeks actually to prepare. But um, I will work on that, kind of show a full design conversation. I'll also show a couple of different ways of using digital design because I like experimenting every couple of years. I like trying something new. So I played around with, uh, that was where I started playing around with Morfolio Trace and Procreate as a design tool. I've abandoned Procreate as a design tool because it um, it doesn't have geo-referencing in terms of creating scalability within the design. And uh, using a landscape architect tool is just, there's more tools inherent to what we do as land designers there. All right. Any final questions, any final comments before we uh, move forward? Cool. Was it valuable today? What are folks taking away from the conversation? Thanks for all your uh, input. Most welcome. What else is, uh, what else are folks taking away from the conversation today? What felt like important to you? I think the whole conversation about biomass is important because I struggle to find good biomass to keep adding to my garden the soil. And it becomes this like, you have to be strategic and timely about leaves wood chips compost uh chop and drop it's um 
I don't know, especially in like the northeastern United States where everything is like so lush and green and there's trees everywhere. You think, oh, it's like I'm not going to have any trouble finding soil to do this. And it's like, no, like you got to be strategic about how you build those reserves of like soil and topsoil to be able to have a healthy garden. So um, especially this time of year when you're out trying to like beat the frost and try to protect the soil and get the stuff out. So um, I enjoy these conversations. Like Hoogie culture for me is like I'm on the fence because I have to build a huge mound now. Where am I going to get, like, I have to get, I have to find stuff to actually mound. And it's, it doesn't come by easy for me, at least in my site. So um, I, I, I like these conversations. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. It reminds me that uh, a good colleague and friend of mine, he's in Kenya right now working on a couple of projects. He's been working on them for close to um, coming up 10 years next year. And uh, he hasn't been back since the beginning of COVID. And 80% of the trees they planted died because it's been a major drought there and the second thing was they didn't have the skills to repair the rainwater system that he installed and, and paid for and when they went back in and they had this conversation um they basically said for every cup of water you take from the rainwater tank for your kids or for yourself because it's a school and kind of a community center you have to put a cup of water on a tree and everyone got that and then they went to the swales that they dug and the swales had largely filled in with salt. And this happens in places like Kenya where you get um, an arid or, or, or a wet, dry uh, tropical environment where you get a monsoon-like rain where it's just like mm. halfway through the day, it's just like throwing buckets on you. Um, you get these silt, siltations of these swales, but it was designed that way to build okay. soil. So three inches down on those swales is some of the most beautiful black soil in a mostly red iron quartz parent material than you can find. So some of these processes are what's called regenerative ruins. We build them so that way they consistently build more soil. And that's what's great about things like a hugel is that a hugel can be mined. This is how Sepp Holter did it originally. Sepp would make these major hugel cultures, like two meters tall by like 50 meters long. And one of the things he would do is he would plant a lot of parsnip into it and a lot of Jerusalem artichoke. And after he had finished decomposing like four or five years down the line, he'd bring in the pigs. And the pigs basically turned to soil for him. The pigs would go rooting for the parsnip and the Jerusalem artichoke. And once it was turned over, he would then spread that over yes. this entire terrace and he would plant into it. And it was just brilliant because you can build soil in situ. Yeah, that's smart. Awesome, folks. Well, thanks so much, everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll meet again in two weeks' time. And all the best with the assignments. Take care. Thank you. Most welcome.